And to the point that Tom made earlier, we do have this long history of this graveyard of well-intentioned annotation efforts that are mostly dead. And we have, on the other hand, these thriving social networks. So we might say, well, you know, what, what do we learn from that? <clears throat> so one thing is that um, if we think of Twitter and things like this, well, they're a general purpose and they're popular. Uh, all kinds of people use them. And that's interesting. You know, if you make a medieval manuscripts annotation tool, you, you know, relatively few people will use it. Um, they also are, have very simple objects and actions. Um, basically, messages and links are mainly what they do. They, they don't do things like link to specific passages or scope or zoom or anything like that. Um, they have many targets. So, you know, what flows through Twitter is basically whatever page or URL or message that anyone wants to comment on. And that's very different from, let's say, uh, even even Rap Genius has a comparatively limited set of of songs that it that it considers, or a medieval manuscripts, just a few. Um, it's very distributed activity in that there's a bunch of people out there just kind of chatting with their friends or in some conversation, not thinking themselves as in one place. Um, it usually, but not necessarily, has some central coordinating network. For example, Twitter. Not necessarily true. You can have things like StatusNet, but the ones that have worked uh, have generally had that. <clears throat> and I would say that a reason it's, it's worthwhile thinking of this as part of the annotation landscape is it has particular properties, and it's particularly good at mixing together a lot of different people and interests. And uh, <clears throat> now, um, thinking about that, that range of annotation types, um, I think one way you could look at it is if you think of the information environment and you compare it to a sort of a, a city or an urban environment, and you think about the kind of the patterns and networks that exist there, well, <clears throat> uh, you know, we have streets and we have plazas where people kind of wander around and they chat, and there's a lot of sort of casual interaction and just looking at, at each other. And I would say that this is, this is sort of analogous to um, things like Twitter or lightweight networks. But in cities, we also have destinations that we go to, like buildings, you know, churches, schools, where we enter into them and then we undertake a focused activity. And I would suggest that you could think of the range of annotation platforms as kind of like these different aspects of a city. There are streets and we, we navigate, we stroll around, we chat with people, but we also arrive at a place and focus on a task. And that might be something like a more formal annotation system for art history or uh, even song lyrics. <clears throat> so now one thing about this is um, so let's say we agree that we're going to consider Twitter and, and, and so on. Well, there are some things that are good about that, but obviously there are some bad things. For example, these are private, commercial, uh, ad-driven, unstable things, which many of us have lots of reasons to be concerned about. So um, one thing we might do, though, is you could say, well, you know, is it possible to, to build a new one? Um, you know, could we build, let's say, some kind of open Twitter? Now, <clears throat> it turns out that uh, a couple of researchers, um, one of whom is Herbert van der Sompel, who is going to be here, uh, they did this work in 2002, 2012. And I came across this a couple months ago, and that's actually kind of what kicked off this project. And basically what they did is they uh, did this, implemented a system, which they refer to as poor man's social network. <clears throat> and they essentially showed that if you take a different architecture than has been normally used, and you don't uh, require immediate real-time activity, you can basically make it vastly more efficient. And so they, they um, let's see, so they did an experiment here. Um, it was all run on Amazon Web Services. I think they spent a couple, total of two or $300 doing this. Uh, here's you know, details of how they did it. And um, they, sent, they, uh, they uh, did a, a it's a real platform, the, the, the server, and then they simulated the demand of it of 200,000 active users. So that's actually a pretty significant percentage of the volume that's like on Twitter at that time, you know, on a given day. And they showed that you could actually handle that whole load with like a few hundred dollars worth of Amazon Web Services. And it's dramatically, and the, the revelation of this was like, wow, you know, we don't really necessarily need a billion dollar uh, venture capital backed public company to, to do something like this. You know, maybe we can actually build something at least to explore. So, 
<coughs> that's what led to this project. So I got in contact with Zhu, Zhu Wu Xi and said, you know, this is amazing. I can't believe these results are astounding. Um, you know, we should, we should take this further. And so in the last couple of months, we've been going back and forth. And um, the, the concept is to open up a, a sort of open prototyping and say, instead of just wondering what Twitter might let us do, why don't we just start from scratch and say, what would we like to do? And we, we don't know how far it'll go. You know, it's possible that you run into some, some bigger problems. It's possible that Twitter shows up with a legal injunction at some point. But in the meantime, it's a way that we can start from scratch and say, well, from a science, scientist or researcher's point of view, what do, you, what do you actually want? Is it important to have real-time real messaging? Or is it more important to have like good archiving, for example, <clears throat> which Twitter doesn't do? Um, so I'll try to wrap this up here, because I know we're, we're, we're five minutes into the break here. But, but, so we've kind of come up with our, our sort of design goals, manifesto, values. Uh, number one, um, learn from what's good and bad about existing systems. You know, Twitter has, I don't know, 300 million active users. W why is that? How do they get there? You know, why did status, why does status.net have almost none? You know, is it, uh, as, as, uh, you know, Tom from Rap Genius said, um, do we, are we fully understanding what drives people? You know, maybe the technology is, is really subsidiary and it's, it's, it's about the, uh, the user psychology. Um, <clears throat> so that's one thing. Second of all, um, a completely open or as open as possible model to distinguish it from things like, like Twitter or academia.edu. Because the way we look at it is we believe that a, a, a messaging system that allows anybody to follow anybody is so fundamentally important and useful that it, it shouldn't be owned by one undependable party. And so even though it's centralized in a sense, the idea is how can it be, I don't know, something like ORCID or W3C where there's a large amount of trust in it that's built up and there's a, it's very consultative. <clears throat> and, and to that end, you know, so far our, our, our intention is it's, it's fully open source, open access information. Um, science scholarly values and requirements but not limited to those people, just like Twitter, anybody can use it. What does that mean? Minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Um, two minutes to coffee. You know. <laughs> um, archival stability and consistency, something you don't really get with commercial services unless you pay them a lot of money for it. Um, fully open API, encourage people to do whatever they want with it. Um, again, not something done by, by commercial networks generally. Um, and then play well with others. Uh, for example, Orchid, Crossref. <clears throat> So where is this now? Um, so Jiwu is, he is at Virginia Tech. He's a librarian, faculty member, and also a PhD candidate. He's working on this, uh, maintaining the code. Um, we are parsing the ORCID public data file. So I think probably most people know ORCID. It's a, it's a database, a registry of uh, many of the world's active researchers. And you can get you know, a portion of it publicly. So the concept is we can, instead of, you know, cold starting and trying to, to get people, you can go to ORCID and, and sort of get profiles and a huge citation graph uh, and then also use their API to update it and then you've sort of pre-populated a, a whole graph already and then people can then you know, en engage with it and become active members if they want to. Um, we're talking to a lot of different people about in what way they would be able to give us activity information. Uh, Archive, SSRN, Mendeley, Elsevier, um, can we get their trust that it's a universal infrastructure that they have a reason to participate in? You know, we think so. Um, talking to a lot of people very open, you know, what, what would you want it to be? If you could have an open Twitter, if you could have an open academia.edu, what would you want it to do? Um, we just got a $5,000 Amazon Web Services grant, which based on our current requirements is going to allow us to run it forever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at least, at least the technical part. Yeah, that's not going to be the bottleneck. Let's put it that way. The bottleneck will be, uh, you know, Jiwu Shi's expertise in, in uh, database design. <clears throat> um, and then finally, uh, like other uh, projects, we're of course looking for other, you know, funds, prototype funding, things like the Sloan Prototype Fund. Uh, I, I don't know that it quite overlaps with the the, the hypothesis one, but things in that vein. And essentially, that's the way we look at it, is it's extending a runway. It's, a, it's an exploration. Um, 
that we think is an interesting conversation about how to how, how can we reimagine scholarly communication and new tools for it. So um, that's all I have. Um, done. Okay. Uh, I'll be around uh, today, tomorrow, possibly uh, on the weekend, and would love to hear from anyone about. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stepping out of the frame. Uh, okay, I'm back. I'm back. I would love to hear from anybody about um, why this is a good idea, why this is a bad idea, um, clarification. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm doing the Occupy signals that <laughs> that Nick gave us yesterday. Um, okay, uh, thank you. I guess I don't know if we have time for a question, but one, one question. Adam, Adam Hyde. Hi, Adam. Thank you. Um, Adam Hyde from Book Sprints. Thank you, Tim, for an interesting presentation. Um, I, I just have, I guess, um, two very short questions. One is, um, when you talk about something like Twitter as being an annotation system, then we, you know, then we can get into a space of talking about something as being a form of annotation. And I, I'm starting to, I had this last year too, where I started to really wonder what annotation is. Is it, are we talking about a specific kind of layering on a UX or UI level one set of information on top of another, um, and we're talking explicitly about this, or are we talking about um, relationships, you know, which, you know, annotation actually being about explicitly defining relationships between things. So I just wondered if you had a response to that. And the other thing is wondering why um, you didn't res uh, outline StatusNet or Thimble, which are two very interesting um, open source code bases that address also this kind of issue. Right. Yeah. So, so the first question: um, How how legitimate is it to call this annotation, or or what constitutes annotation? I think that's a good question. I'm not sure how how rigorously or clearly it's defined in the initiative so far. I think generally there's a, there's a kind of a stakeholder community approach, which is sort of the people who come forth and call themselves people interested in annotation. What are they doing? And um, that's fine, except it may be that um, you know maybe we're we're too limited a group of people, and there's you know we're not there's this other activity that should be considered part of it. It's just that people aren't calling it annotation; they're calling it you know tweeting, whatever, uh, posting. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think you know to to me, I, I just don't see as sharp a distinction between these two things because some commenting systems are, for example, uh, fact link is using Twitter. That's an example of how it's connected with it. Um, you may have annotation systems that don't do anything more than use a common URL to know that they're talking about the same thing. Activity can be in various places and gathered by things like LiveFire. We have LiveFire here. So I, you know, to me, I feel like commenting and interacting with stuff, there's not a sharp distinction between formal annotation so-called systems and, and, and other ways. And I would say, well, you know, where's the conversation? To me, that, that's a really crucial point. Is uh, there's no use, um, you know, there's no use building stuff that nobody that nobody uses, or if there's no conversation occurring there. Um, and uh, there's a there's a pattern of uh, what is it? Worse is better, you know, in in, a, in computer science. Sometimes the, the dumb thing catches on, and in a way, eventually becomes better because it's where people are working. Um, and the other question was um, about status.net and these other things. Um, I do very much keep those in mind, and I've tracked those for a long time. I was a backer of app.net, which was uh, not exactly open source, but kind of a bit of an anti-Twitter. And um, I think it's very crucial, but not quite answered, you know, why did thing some things work and others not? Um, it seems that nothing decentralized or federated has really caught on, which I think is important to ask why. Um, is it that it can't update fast enough? I don't know. Um, uh, is it that you have to be proprietary to get enough investor interest? Uh, I'm not sure, but def definitely there's, um, as with other annotation things, there, there's a graveyard and a, well, not just a graveyard, a, a set of precedents that that exist um, uh, to learn from. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we we don't have we don't have to completely reinvent things. We can we can look at these existing models. So. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you.